It is my pleasure to welcome you to the International House of the University of Chicago and to the opening day of the Chicago Paris Cabaret Connection. Today's event, the Cabaret Connection Films and Razzle Dazzle, is co-sponsored by, by the International House Global Voices Performing Arts Series, the Chicago Paris Cabaret Connection, Illinois Humanities, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Illinois General Assembly. Founded in, 13, in 1932 by John D. Rockefeller Jr. as a co-educational residence for students around the world, International House also serves as a cultural center for metropolitan Chicago. The Global Voices Public Programming Series advances this goal by promoting cross-cultural understanding and opportunities for civic discourse on community, national, and world affairs. From our music and dance performances, to films, lectures, conferences, round and roundtable discussions, I hope all of you will return to the International House throughout the remainder of this quarter to attend other Global Voices programs. You can find information about these upcoming events on the literature table in the front entrance. Please make sure to sign up for our email list in order to receive announcements about all of our exciting events. Now, I am very pleased to introduce to you Claudia Omel to begin today's very special program. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Welcome to the Chicago Paris Cabaret Connexion, which began last year in Paris in September when a group of singers from Chicago met a group of singers from France. And we began the conversation about what is cabaret and how do we promote it because we love this art form so much. I'm going to blame Faith Prince for starting this idea when she said, let's go to France and do some master classes in cabaret. And I said, well, oh, yeah, easier said than done. And now we're doing it. So, and, and we will go back to France next year. But before we begin the first film, let me introduce the filmmaker, Cheryl E. Grant. I want to thank um, Claudia for bringing together this extraordinary uh, group of people from Paris and, and all over the country uh, to celebrate this beautiful, rare, incredibly important art form, cabaret. Um, I'd like to give her a round of applause for all of her. <laughs> Early on when I was interviewing people, one of the, very, one of the first people that I was speaking with um, said to me, uh, you know you can't make a film about cabaret. <laughs> and um, it's true. And I did it anyway. But uh, yes, cabaret is it is the experience of being uh, in a in a room one on one. It's about intimacy. It's it's about a night where uh, you are alone with the performer in um, in these very unique rooms. Uh, Pat Carroll called them. Uh, 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 she called. I'm sorry. Uh, she called them uh, upholstered sewers, I believe. <laughs> but when the lights come down and the candles are lit and you're alone with the performer, a magic happens. That doesn't happen in any other uh, art form. And it never happens again. It's there that one night, captured, and, uh, and it's unique in that way. I believe that cabaret has even more relevance now than it ever has. The one-on-one, -on -one, the humanity, the contact, which uh, is so immediate. It's the candlelight that is a light in the dark, especially in these times, because uh, one thing that I really loved about cabaret is that discrimination doesn't breathe in cabaret. Um, hatred doesn't do. And romance truly is romantic. <laughs> 
That was Andrea Marcovici's line, not mine. <laughs> but it's so true. And it's been the mo one of the most important things that I've ever done in my life, creating this documentary. And I'm joined today by um, producer Julia Cook, who uh, is also my partner in Chanson Film. And Julia is one of the most uh, renowned Northwest producers. She's worked with many great artists, and, like Gus Van Zandt, to name one. <laughs> and um, her grace and, and artistry uh, is resonant in this film. And uh, also uh, with me today is uh, our French producer and uh, Charles Maillet, who uh, had his own uh, French-American connection. Uh, he was the star of PBS series uh, French in Action. If anybody remembers PBS, yes. <laughs> yes, Robert's in the house. <laughs> and uh, he's a wonderful actor, uh, uh, writer, producer, and uh, I'm so thankful for him helping us to have our Paris connection. It was a dream for me to be able to go to some of the rooms in Paris and bring that to the film, and, uh, and we are so blessed that he was able to help us have, make that happen. Also, I have uh, Alex Ryback is in the house, and I would like to get a round of applause for Mr. Alex, the most incredible, brilliant, performer, composer, musical director, uh, just an incredible uh, person who led me into this world and let me turn the camera on him. He's one of the stars of this film, and it would not have happened without him. And uh, without further ado, I um, present the Torchbearers, and thank you all so much for coming. Ovations for a wise man and a fool is a vocal canvas film. Elizabeth Doyle and I have been traveling many times to museums or libraries or arts centers to present slides and song together. And we wanted to capture that somehow in a film cinematic way. So we created the next film using two songs. The first by Elizabeth Doyle, Like a Tree, is inspired by her father. And the second song is a French song, Bravo pour le plume. Yes. My film harks back to a time when Chicago actually uh, was on the same par with New York in terms of the number of cabarets, nightclubs, jazz clubs. Uh, and uh, at that point, my, my little bit of French says, the creme de la creme was Mr. Kelly's Chicago. And uh, Mr. Kelly's uh, featured both a singer and a comedian every night. So for uh, the price of a drink, you could see Woody Allen and Nancy Wilson or Sarah Vaughan and Barbara Streisand come on together. And this was a, a, a Chicago institution that went on from 1953 all the way to 1974. So it was a brief, a brief light. Uh, but it lives on long in anybody that's been there. And my one connection with uh, Cabaret that I noticed was my father owned another uh, club called the London House, which featured the greatest uh, jazz pianists of the time. So uh, it would hit five, Oscar Peterson cut five albums there, Errol Garner was there every single year, uh, George Shering, and the first woman that opened up uh, the London House in 1953, which I had the honor of interviewing and getting to know was Barbara Carroll. And uh, Barbara Carroll went on to follow Bobby Short at the Carlisle for well over 10 years. And so the bridge between jazz, cabaret, jazz singers, uh, it was just a wonderful potpourri. I don't know where, where they all divide, but I think Mr. Kelly's and London House were an important part of that. So we've been working on uh, producing uh, this film for the last three years. I have over a hundred interviews, uh, including many of the celebrities that you'll see in the, in the clip, but I also have staff members, uh, local musicians, sidemen, the people that own uh, Rush Street bars and restaurants and, and cabarets. And uh, we're going into post-production for the film and hopefully you'll be able to look for it on, on PBS next year. Questions? I 
I'm happy to answer them. And we, I also passed out some cards that uh, have our, our website, uh, www Mr. Kelly's Chicago. And we have a very active uh, Facebook page where we're posting uh, things about all the musicians and comics uh, daily. It's some very interesting people that are sharing their memories of Chicago and Rush Street uh, back in this wonderful time. So I hope you enjoy the clip. Last but not least of these films. This is a very different film. Uh, Clotilde keeps on saying, well, it's not about cabaret, and I'm saying, yes, it is, because if you think back to the history of cabaret in the 1880s, 90s, 1900, it wasn't just about songs. It was about shadow theater and new cinema without sound in those days, but it was anything goes in an intimate space, and I wanted to celebrate that kind of diversity by inviting a wonderful cabaret performer who happens to also be making very interesting film projects to come and show us some excerpts of hers. Clotilde Rouen. Um, so yes, what you're going to see is three portraits out of a seven portrait, 30 minutes short film, experimental one. And when I decided to create this project, it was all about mixing, uh, no, not mixing, using different canals, emotional canals to express something. So images, dance, moving bodies, and music. And I really wanted each canal to be a layer of one big thing. We have in France a cake called le millefeuille, which means uh, a thousand of, of leaves. So that was the idea, you know, and not having one illustrating the other. So, and I, and I started this project having the idea of using these images after in, in an exhibition, in a performance. So somehow, um, the idea is coming back from the two dimension to the three dimension of the live performance in a second time. So, and the theme of the this, this seven portraits is um, a reflection, a totally subjective reflection about womanhood and feminine. Um, so you're going to see three of these portraits. I call them portraits. And I hope you're going to enjoy. Um, that's it. Yes, Chicago, Julia Cabrabel for the Torchbearers, Lindsay Kuo for her XXY, Jean Mayer from the uh, uh, Torchbearers as well. Uh, I'm, I think I'll just help moderate this discussion a little bit. And um, I, I want to say, boy, it was so interesting coming back to Chicago with the, the portraits from XXY. Um, it, it's a very different feel, but it, the jazz, it feels like something that came out of the London house or something, right? So, um, I wanted to see if you want first to say something that you didn't have time to say before the film. Yeah, well, um, let me think. Uh, I, I'm just very honored to be here and uh, uh, our, this particular film uh, that, that you saw today was uh, created for a music festival in, in uh, England and um, we have uh, a much longer version of the film as well that uh, includes a lot of, a lot of uh, extra performers um, and composers and uh, stars of cabaret. It's, it's been uh, a really incredible uh, journey to be able to um, go to a lot of the, the most uh, wonderful rooms in the United States and, uh, and be able to record these, these people, a lot of whom are no longer with us, uh, which is difficult. It was hard for me to see the movie. To, uh, it, it, it very much touches me and moves me that we've, uh, in the course of, of our creating uh, this project, that we've lost so many wonderful people. But it also was a tremendous sense of pride for me that these rooms and that these uh, artists have been uh, captured and preserved. Um, 
uh, wonderful to see Paula Lawrence, uh, you know, and and, uh, and Donald and all these wonderful people who uh, really uh, resurrected cabaret um, in in the 80s, essentially, uh, brought, uh, uh, reopened the Oak Room, and, uh, and there were so many rooms, and I was lucky uh, as a young person to have been in New York at that time and gotten to experience uh, Julie Wilson everywhere, and <laughs> all these wonderful, wonderful people, which is what inspired me at the, uh, uh, to do this in the first place. Um, because it's such a, a rarefied and, and wonderful experience. Karen Mason at the duplex. Um, and so uh, it's, it's really a pleasure to have uh, been able to be a historian for, for this art form and for so many of these performers. Um, anyway, and also, uh, is there anything that you wanted to add? Uh, my name's Julia, and it's, it's just been um, really a dream come true to create this film with uh, Cheryl, who's an extraordinary director, writer, actor, and artist, and, um, and Charles as well, also an extraordinary actor, director, and writer. Um, we, the three of us, among other people involved in this film who aren't here today, also created a film 20 years ago uh, called John Strasberg, Accidentally on Purpose about the um, director, John Strasberg. So it was really important for us to bring this same team of collaborators together to create this film. So I'm really happy we were able to accomplish that. Uh, thank you very much for the response. That'll keep us going to the next phase to get this thing made and out to Chicago. Uh, you know, it was just fun to be as part of this group with, you know, looking back and being with like-minded people that want to preserve this history and realize that you know it's so important to keep it alive. And I certainly also appreciate the last film where, as, as Claudia said, where you're you know you're seeing the jazz, you're seeing Chicago, and it could have been a it could have been an experimental film from the 50s, 60s, with the jazz. And so that you know to bring that you know to keep it for the next generation is what's really important, and to see that you know the interest and uh, the joy that you know that younger people can find in this stuff is what makes it all worthwhile. So, thank you so much. Michelle, do you want to speak to your experience, the connection to Paris and Cabaret? We could talk about the subject matter, I think, as well. Uh, sure, so basically, um, Cheryl and I happened to be in Paris at the same time, and she told me about uh, the movie she was making. And uh, I had lived in Paris for 25 years, many, many years ago. And so basically, I contacted Christian Siret, who was the artistic director of French in Action, and also the great uh, movie barrier, Ariel Nouchkin Molière. And he's got a lot of connections, so I called Christian and we went to meet him. And you saw a little bit of the interview. He knew Colette personally, for instance. And he talked about the history of Cabaret de Chanois which you have seen in part two, three, and four. <laughs> and uh, my, well, I got two sisters who live there, so one of my brother-in-law mentioned that really close to where he lives was the Cabaret chez Michou. So we went and met Michou. Uh, and we agreed to go back and film. And also, uh, I have a very good friend of mine whose wife uh, knew uh, Isabelle George, the red hair that you saw perform. So basically, uh, just happening to be in Paris at the same time and talking about her movie and uh, thinking about the people I knew, the, you know, everything fell into place, which allowed us to uh, capture some wonderful moments in Paris that you will see, hopefully, in the future. We're entertaining questions. So I have a microphone here, and maybe Steve can give us the wired mic up here so that this mic can come into the house. Um, you are certainly welcome to raise any kind of question or comment about the content of the films or the filmmaking. So there, there's two sides of it. While you're thinking about that, and while we get this other microphone set up for us, um, I wanted to ask Clotilde actually um, more about the, um, how, you, how you chose Chicago and how you actually, like who wrote the music, how did you pull, 
how did you pull collaborators together? Because I think one of the things that is very much part of the cabaret community is the sense of collaboration. It's true that there's a different pulse to it here or in New York from Paris. In, New, in the States, we've tended to think of solo work, the one woman show, the one man show. Um, but we are always seeking the collaborators. The first one, of course, is our pianist. And then the second one is the house itself, and the third one is the, you know, the fans who are going to build it. And so, um, in filmmaking, you guys are automatically collaborators. Nobody makes a film by themselves. So, and I know this from the film that I made. I met circus workers for the first time. It was an amazing experience to to be with film, to be with circus workers. And so, just wondering about. That. Um, yeah, it's a good question, especially because on that, on that project, about, I think, 30 or 40 artists have been involved, since I wanted each portrait to have a very specific atmosphere, a very specific character to um, um, embody uh, as best as possible the feelings I had uh, about what I wanted to say or describe. So each portrait is a different dancer or dance crew, is a different singing, and you saw Chicago just before it was San Francisco, and just before it was north of France. And, um, and each soundtrack is also a specific band for each portrait. So um, yeah, loads of people involved in it. And, uh, but one, one, one cinematographer actually, one cameraman, and a great one. Beautiful eye. Uh, yeah, he has, he has, and um, so and music. So I also because I wanted each pieces to be very specific. So I collaborated. I co-composed each song instead of composing all the music by myself to make sure that I would have the exact um, feeling I wanted again, and to to make sure also that it will be very specific and, and not. Because I think it's pretty hard when you do all by yourself to be very different and not too similar between each piece. So I called actually very good friends I had already worked with, and I was very proud. I was really in love with their work, and I would know they would fit perfectly. And actually, it's what happened because. They never saw the, the images. Also, I, I wanted when I I edited the the, the movies um, myself, and so I I didn't want the musicians and the composers to see the images before. And the dancers, none of the dancers danced on the mu on the music too, so nobody knew anything about the other part but me. And I wanted it because I wanted to make sure it won't be a clip like music. Um, for images, or the opposite, images for music. So for me, the only way to make sure about it was to keep separate each process. And also when I edited things, I edited without the music, the images, because I wanted the images to have their own rhythm, very strong. To me, if it would work without the music, then it would work with the music on it. That was very, very important. And actually, Jean Cocteau, so, there is a link with the cabaret somehow, <laughs> which is one of my great inspiration. Uh, Jean Cocteau had applied the same process. I didn't know it, but when I explained it to friends, they told me that he had uh, he had experiences when he created um, Le Jeune Homme et la Mort, uh, which was exactly the same. He had all the dancers working on back pieces, back, back. You said back in English, and back. Bah. Yeah, and on the day first, on the night first of the of, of the show, he played jazz music. <laughs> so you see, and he called it the hazardous synchronicity. I, I love it. So um, I experimented it, and that was the process. And what was that? Why Chicago, of course. So um, because. The idea is no words, and that was very important. There's only one song with the words, the, the, the portrait called Juliet, um, that you know you saw. Um, so no words, because I wanted it to be the more um, global and the more um, 
yeah, barrierless, no frontier. So I thought if we escape from the words and we keep the, the power of images and music and bodies to express things, then it would be more available for anybody to understand it and to feel it. Because my, my deep um, conviction is that uh, I, wanted, I wanted it to be more like a, a dream dream-like thing. So when you're dreaming, you're experiencing a lot of things, you have loads of feelings coming up, then you wake up and you're like, oh, that was, that was really weird. And then you start to think about it. And maybe you go to the psychologist and really think about it. <laughs> but, but first, you're moved by what you felt. And I wanted it. I wanted, I wanted people to be moved. And then start to think about, oh, why did she put it this here or there or everything? So every single image and things are very, on my side, I very, very uh, thought about. I, like, I mean, I, I, I thought about, yeah, considered, exactly. So the, the last portrait you saw, which is called Ishtar, who was the, the queen from... Um, at the same time, she was queen of the of the war and the fecundity, yeah. and so and maybe you got it. It was it's all about womanhood being. Ha what does that mean to be a mother? Is that is that something that we have to do as a woman? Is that something that the society presents us to be when we want to be a working woman and all these conflicts? So I wanted to have this masculine um, expression. And we could start a debate of what we put behind masculine and feminine, but we're not going to start now. So I wanted the masculine, as we call it now, uh, to be very strong and express, and so this verticality. So I wanted a, a, a town, vertical, and with loads of um, geometries and lines and, and perspectives and things like that. And for me, it was Chicago, definitely, because I mean, you know, you have like to me one of the most beautiful town in the world. And architecture, I mean, that's true, that's true. And architecture is just extraordinary. It's so like complex and multiple, and you still have some rounds in the verticality, like with this building, which is a, a car park on by the river, you know? The wrong one. Oh, yeah, like a crazy one, you know? So it's just an amazing city that tells so many things at the same time. And you have the river, and the river is the same, for me, it embodies the feminine, the water. So you have the water, you have the feminine, if we, if we consider yin and yang uh, philosophy, you have the water and you have the verticality. Verticality can be, can be associated to the mountains, you know? So it's really a deep city for me that has, in its essence, all of this that I wanted to to talk about and plus Chicago City has been very nice because they gave us the permit to film anywhere very easily. So thank you. Is this working? Yes. yes it is. So this one's for us. Yes. So question? You're going to make Milan run from one end of the room to the other. Yes, hi. This is regarding the Mr. Kelly piece. And I was just wondering uh, what the source was for the interviews. Is that archived footage or uh, because I suspect that many of those people interviewed are not with us any longer. No, those, those interviews have all been done over the last three years. And uh, the Marienthal brothers had a reputation that still lasted 50 years where somebody like you know Woody Allen agreed to, to do it to do the interviews uh, Smothers Brothers just remembered how well they were treated uh, you, know, you talked about the intimacy of a cabaret this was really really a family and uh, so I you know I was able to reach all these people and they agreed to do the, the interviews I think the only one that has passed now is, is Dick Gregory uh, passed away uh, but everybody else is still still alive and well for now. Oh, that's great. Congratulations. Hello? Oh, Atla? My name is Carla Gordon, and I'm a singer-songwriter here in Chicago, and I am the uh, correspondent for Cabaret Scenes Magazine here in Chicago. That's the National Magazine of Cabaret. I loved your documentary. I heard great, great things about it.
but I think it's also very important to realize in this art, I mean, what, what its dynamic is, is in places like Chicago, there's a thriving, thriving community of singers and songwriters. Uh, Boston's pretty busy, so it's a, it's a big world out there, and I, I think we need to honor that and, and acknowledge that. Torchbearers, question being New York centric. Hi, yes, I totally agree. <laughs> and um, we filmed in um, other other cities than New York. I'm sorry. Yes, we were we Los Angeles, San Francisco. We didn't get to Chicago, but we're still a bit of a work in progress. And um, and it's very important to us to honor all of the cities in the rooms when we decided to create this hour-long version, it was actually, uh, we had a request from uh, a music school in London to screen it uh, for the school, uh, and they needed something that was shorter, and we took it as an opportunity <laughs> to create uh, this version that you saw today of, uh, of the piece, um, and we did focus it on uh, the Oak Room, and the closing of the Oak Room, and also on Donald Smith's passing, um, as a as a way of kind of a point of uh, part of departure for a part one uh, uh, that uh, would work for their festival, and also uh, kind of have a, a, a little bit of a, a story to it that um, talked about uh, all of those things and the and the fragility and the strength, and we're trying to bring in the politics, but we. We actually have a tremendous amount of footage from other cities, and I would love the opportunity to <laughs> to incorporate Chicago and all of the other uh, places as well. And it was incredibly uh, challenging even to uh, put an hour's worth of material together. I think it's, it's essentially they wanted 45 minutes at first, and we were like, we can't do it. So we were pulling from uh, you know a, a lot of material in order to kind of boil it down to the, the this version's uh, first story, and that's why we called it part one as well. Uh, but yeah, there's several rooms that, that are, aren't included in this, and, um, but I, I really, I agree wholeheartedly. I think that, uh, uh, that, that all of the cities, too, bring their own unique um, flavor to, uh, to these rooms, and all of the performers all over the uh, country are, um, are also, uh, I think being drawn more and more into these rooms so that they can uh, express themselves. One of the things that I really love about Cabaret, wherever you are in whatever city you're in, is that you're going to hear original material uh, that's very different than what you're, you would hear normally uh, on the radio. Uh, I mean, really great art songs, funny, funny uh, comedy songs, uh, great, you know, there's just so much wonderful songwriting going on in this, uh, in this venue and in this genre that um, I really, it's one of my, uh, it's one of the things I'm most interested in. And actually, uh, we had a lot of ori original material in our other longer film, and we incorporated a lot of artists um, with their original songs. So I did, I want to reassure you, I'm very interested in that, and I also appreciate your bringing that up, because it, it is essential. So, thank you. So I appreciate the clarification that this is a work in progress. I was going to ask where, where we might look forward to seeing more of it. If you have plans, uh, I was, it looks to me like it would be just a treasure on PBS, on television. So, uh, any plans for uh, future incarnations or episodes? I'll, I'll answer that. Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, we, as Cheryl mentioned, uh, this, this one hour uh, part one probably represents maybe a tenth of the footage that we, that we have. There's so many artists, and Alex can speak to this too, that aren't represented in this, this version. So um, we feel very strongly that it would make a wonderful series as well. Uh, we're currently uh, in discussion with some people that have already gotten content on Netflix. And, looking into getting this picked up as a series. Um, so that's our goal. But we will, regardless of the series, we will certainly be cutting and distributing 
other versions of this film. Plus facile. Oui, c'est d'abord simplement une, une réflexion. Dans les films que nous avons vus, et particulièrement les premiers, on sent une nostalgie de, du cabaret français. Ça commence par une tour Eiffel, et puis le lapin agile. Vous pouvez juste attendre, je vais traduire. Oui, d'accord. Alors je repasse. Ah, oui. Donc, <rire> dans les films que nous avons vus, on sent, we've seen together, on sent une we've nostalgie, une nostalgie de, du cabaret tel qu'il a commencé à exister en France. In France. D'ailleurs, on voit le, la tour Eiffel, le de la Magie, enfin, tous les, les grands trésors de Montmartre. Et ce Montmartre. qui est curieux, c'est que nous, actuellement en France, And on est surtout right euh, à l'écoute des musiques américaines. Et on renonce nous-mêmes à cette tradition. Les cabarets en France, à Paris, malheureusement, ferment les uns après les autres, il faut bien le dire. Et euh, ici, de voir cette, here, cet enthousiasme et ce désir de reprendre euh, ces, cet événement, enfin, cette forme d'expression, euh, c'est tout à fait touchant. Je représente l'Alliance francophone qui est totalement in inconnue aux, aux États-Unis, qui exerce surtout en, en, en Afrique, et qui a pour but de défendre la langue française par un problème, et aussi surtout les valeurs françaises. Les valeurs françaises qu'on retrouve dans la chanson, et la chanson est également un bon vecteur d'une langue à l'étranger. Moi j'ai appris beaucoup d'anglais en écoutant Marania Jackson par exemple. J'ai appris beaucoup d'anglais en écoutant Michael Jackson. Marania Jackson et donc... Maria Oui, oui, le gospel. Marania Jackson. Marania Jackson, excusez-moi. Oui, mais vous pouvez aussi... Je vais te répondre. Et puis on, on voit donc, euh, on enseigne le français aussi par la langue. J'étais au Japon et donc, euh, les Japonais euh, apprennent la langue par euh, Edith Piaf, par Aslav euh, Rouf, etc. Donc la chanson est très très importante. Et je trouve que ce, elle, le, les valeurs qui sont euh, portées par la chanson, elles ne sont ni françaises ni américaines, elles sont tout simplement humaines. Et cette, euh, je trouve que cette, euh, cette initiative de Cabaret Connection et, et la France, enfin cette, cet échange, euh, je pense qu'on peut peut-être la développer, y compris par, par la France francophone qui pourrait peut-être nous aider pour la prochaine édition, peut-être à, peut à Chicago. En tout cas, bravo. Oui, bonjour. Enfin, je vais faire comme Michel, je vais parler en français. Puis, si vous pouvez traduire, merci. Well, here. Non, je voudrais vous dire que nous, nous avons vécu toutes ces grandes époques du cabaret. We lived through all these great periods of cabaret. Dans les années 80, in the 80s, je passais dans 17 boîtes différentes. I was performing in 17 different places. Alors, c'était des vrais cabarets, ça s'appelait le canotier cabaret. du pied de la butte. Le canotier du pied de la butte. boulevard en Jouchoir, qui était un cabaret illustre. Je ne sais pas si vous imaginez. Very illustrious cabaret. Une, entre 10 et 15 artistes qui passaient chaque soir dans le cabaret. Each evening, 10 to 15 chaque artiste performing. était payé et on avait droit au bar gratuit. <rire> Alors, à donc on passait après, on pouvait faire, je mens pas, euh, pratiquement, j'ai certains copains qui faisaient entre 5 et 10 cabarets par soir. Oui, c'est-à-dire ils commençaient à 9 heures. Ensuite, alors je parlais du pied de la butte, à côté du pied de la butte, il y avait l'abbé Constantin, qui était tenu par Denise. Après le cabaret, euh, vous pouviez aller rive droite, rive gauche, vous pouviez vous balader partout. Et ce qui s'est passé, il faut le savoir, c'est que les gens qui ont aimé nos quartiers, moi j'habite le 5e arrondissement, je suis en plein quartier latin, et dans ces quartiers merveilleux, on pouvait stationner. On pouvait... Alors, ce qui se passait, c'est que les gens, le pied de la butte, par exemple, pouvaient boire une coupe de champagne à 3 heures du matin. Et là, vous pouviez laisser les voitures sur les trottoirs. Et il n'y a pas un flic qui intervenait, parce qu'ils étaient invités gratuitement à boire le champagne au bal. Donc, c'était des lieux sur ce que les loyers ont terriblement augmenté. C'est-à-dire que où j'habite, par exemple, c'est que les loyers ont terriblement augmenté. Oh, C'est-à-dire que où j'habite, par exemple, 50 mètres carrés, c'est loué 1500 euros par mois. Ok, so 50 square meters is like. Uh...
Alors ce qui se passe, c'est que les gens aujourd'hui qui arrivent dans ces beaux quartiers qu'on appelle le quartier Mouffetard, où vous aviez un cabaret formidable chez Félix, eh bien ces gens-là ont demandé le silence. Oh, so the people moving these neighborhoods the, and the rents are very high, these people want silence. Et ça, ça, encore, ça pose un grave problème so it's a major parce, que, bah, parce que les flics viennent généralement vers 11h du soir. Because the policemen are on 11 p.m. at night. Alors on arrive encore euh, au bout de la montagne de Geneviève, il y a deux établissements qui fonctionnent encore, il y a le vieux Londingue. So there are two places that still uh, function, Montagne Saint Geneviève, which is uh, in the fifth or sixth. Oui, cinquième, oui, cinquième, sur le pied du Panthéon. Uh -huh. Donc là, vous avez donc le vieux Londingue qui fonctionne encore une fois par trimestre. Ok. Le violon bar oh, Dingue, dingue, complètement dingue, le violon fou. Quoi. Oh, le violon dingue, ok, excusez-moi. Et alors vous avez encore donc ce petit bar à vin qui est formidable, qui s'appelle le tripot. Bar, le tripot. Alors on a, on a monté des soirées cabaret. So they were, they were cabaret et l'URSAF est arrivé. Alors l'URSAF, vous savez, ce sont les contrôles. Oh, they were controls. Ils font que vous devez payer la, la retraite du voisin. <laughs> Because you have to pay for alors on a réussi à résoudre le problème en mettant une corbeille à l'entrée et en mettant pour les artistes. Donc ils ont fermé les yeux, malheureusement c'était tous les jeudis, maintenant c'est un jeudi. So now it's only one Thursday every month. C'est un jeudi par mois maintenant. La SACEM est arrivée. Alors vous connaissez ça, je ne sais pas si vous avez Laissez-moi expliquer, la SACEM c'est... Ok, Aska, thank you. Voilà, mais le problème de la SACEM c'est gentil, mais les artistes ne touchent pas grand chose. Sauf que c'est pas ce qu'il y a à la télé. Sauf télévision, Except if you're on TV. Voilà, et puis les galas, les grands concerts, mais dans les petits bars, les petits But cabarets, little bars, malheureusement, unfortunately. le taxe est arrivé, qui est énorme, les patrons de cabarets doivent payer une taxe énorme, c'est-à-dire que ça va jusqu'à euh, 10 euros par plat, par assiette. Ok, donc to 10 euros, euros. that's 15 dollars per plate, per dish. Voilà, donc tout ça, je veux dire, ça, ça a tué le cabaret tout doucement. So all this is killing, little by little, very slowly, kind of killing cabaret. Et actuellement, je pense que Michel sera d'accord avec moi. And I think Michel will agree with me. De création de nouveaux cabarets. Nous, on ne peut pas créer de nouveaux cabarets. Voilà. Alors c'est le même phénomène pour la musique de jazz. So it's the same phenomenon for jazz, for instance. Voilà, c'est-à-dire que le petit journal, il vient de changer de direction. Le petit journal, which is a place where I guess people listen to jazz, there's a new people. Bon, par là, c'est Saint-Michel, Saint okay. ça s'appelle Le Petit Journal. Saint-Michel est à vendre, on ne sait pas si on tient en Saint-Michel est pour vendre, anyone interested in buying a place in Paris called Saint-Michel. Voilà, et Montparnasse, maintenant, ils font de la variété. Et Montparnasse, ils font de la variété. Ils font de la variété. Ils font de la variété. J'ai eu la chance de jouer à la coupole. J'ai eu la chance de jouer à la coupole, qui est très fameuse. J'ai animé pendant longtemps les soirées de la Tour Eiffel. La Tour Eiffel, il n'y a plus ses animations, ces soirées de la Tour Eiffel. Comment dire, I was the host to your special evenings at the Eiffel Tower. That that's over now. Voilà. J'ai alors on va pas je vais m'arrêter mais à à Bobino il y avait du cabaret. Oh yeah, I remember Bobino. Philippe Bouvard a créé a créé une émission d'ailleurs ça s'appelait le Petit Théâtre de Bouvard et vous pouviez donc faire du cabaret dans des lieux illustres comme l'Olympia avec une toute petite salle. It was also possible to do cabaret more prestigieux or larger venues like l'Olympia de Paris, but not anymore. Enfin voilà, bon, je vais arrêter là, mais pour vous dire, il n'y a, a pas la relève non plus. Je ne vois pas autour de moi des jeunes reprendre comme autrefois. Voilà. Mais restez optimiste et puis vous êtes là, hein. ça me sauve. Ok. Question en anglais, peut-être Merci, ça c'est Clovis. Et avant, c'était Michel Barguet, qui was speaking as Clovis the musical part, and Michel Barbier, you will be able to see them Wednesday night in concert at the Old Town School of Folk Music. I just want to reiterate for everyone, this is part of an eight-day conference. We're the first event of it. And starting tomorrow, very bright and early at 9.30 in the morning, we're going to be meeting at Davenport's Cabaret, the, one of the few dedicated cabaret rooms that still remains here in Chicago. Um, to work together, and then in the evenings we have concerts um, by many of the people who are in this room, and that's including Michel and Clovis. Um, 
And I'll make special mention also for Thursday night, Paris Noir will be an evening dedicated to black culture in Paris, African-American culture in Paris. And again, Michelle Barguet will be there because she was private secretary to Josephine Baker in her youth. And we will have that very special connection to our back there. So, um, we put the lights on so you can see. But um, we're going to wrap up with one more question or comment. Um, I have a question for the representative from Mr. Kelly's three-parter. One, um, do you think Chicago is still a great jazz city? Two, what can we do to keep that genre alive? And three, why do you love jazz so much? <laughs> Well, I think just uh, maybe from what I gathered from the uh, the last comment that you know the, the passing of a lot of times in a lot of great places, I think actually Chicago has a lot of live music. Uh, you know, if you try and go out and just look at the listings, you're never going to be able to go to, to all of them. And uh, you know, whether you know there of course are many pop rock alternative, but there is jazz inspired. Uh, there's young people that are doing. You know, original music, and uh, we have some great clubs all the way from Winters Jazz Club. I'll put a good plug in for for Scottsdale. And it went Winters is a great 80-person uh, jazz room in Streeterville. Uh, Joe Siegel's still going at the Jazz Showcase. Uh, you know, Andy Green Mill. Uh, there's you know there's a lot of great places in Chicago. So Chicago is lucky that we do have a lot of. Uh, smaller jazz places, and I hope you're going to get a chance to, to visit them. Uh, and, you know, relatively inexpensive if you get out during the week and stuff. Uh, so in terms of, you know, my love with jazz is I used to go down on Sundays with my family to the London House mostly and, uh, and see Oscar Peterson and Errol Garner. I remember Errol Garner grunting at the piano and uh, uh, the great jazz band coming to my home. I said Barbara Carroll would come to my home. Uh, I did the lights for Sarah Vaughan when I was uh, working at Mr. Kelly's in college, so I was I was just steeped in it. And uh, but you know, I also do like rock and, and pop and other things as well. So I don't think it has to be exclusive. I think that, you know, in terms of keeping it alive, we have to work on you know making sure it's it's entertaining and and engaging for young people that you know maybe that are getting uh, a. Uh, you know, introduction to it. We're doing a show at Winters, uh, which is a young pianist named Joe Alterman on December 7th and 8th. And uh, he's a great uh, original pianist, but he's doing his homage to the uh, London House artists. And he's worked with uh, with Ramsey and Les McCann. And uh, he's gonna be showing how he's in, he's been inspired by these, these jazz greats. So if you get to Winters on uh, December 7th and 8th, that's gonna be a great show. Did I get all three? Yes. <laughs> Can I just add something? Being part of the jazz scene, and I mean, I had the chance to travel around the world to perform jazz, and having friends all over. I think Chicago is really, really dynamic. It's crazy. Like you have, you, know, you have a guy like a wonderful drummer, Mike Reed, who opened a jazz club, like a musician opening a jazz club constellation. And every day, like just recently, there's another drummer who's just, it's the young cat, so talented, another drummer. His name is escaping again from Mama. Yeah, Makaya McCraven. And he's just like rocketing all over the world with his new album, uh, Universal Being, it's called, so check it out, it's just released. So I think Jason in Chicago is just amazing and, and also provides music, and you're really lucky for that. just like to uh, add something before we finish. Uh, I think there's something very important, uh, especially of being a cabaret, and has to do with uh, the possibility um, of insolence. For instance, two anecdotes really fast. There were three journal one journalist and two of his friends in 1910. They were kind of tired of what was called Le Salon des Indépendants, which was an exhibition of the new modern painters. So because they were tired of the critiques and of, of the hula-la about that, they decided to pull the trick. So Fridé, who was the guy running the Lapin Agile, had a donkey. And the donkey's name was Lolo. So they asked a bailiff to come and a photographer. And basically what they did, they tied a brush to the, to the tail of the donkey. 
and they put a, 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 a canvas behind the donkey and they fed the donkey and they put the brush of course in colors so the donkey when, when it was fed with carrots his, he would move his tail and paint a canvas and they sent the, the, the canvas with a fake uh, you know, a painter that did not exist and then the critiques and the, the painting was called a coucher de soleil sur l'Adriatique which means sunset on the Adriatic Sea and there were really you know uh, critics then express, expressed what they thought about the painting and then the, the prank came out so that's uh, I, th I think a South Cabaret that is very important and also to finish I think it was at Le Chat Noir. The Prince of Wales went to Le Chat Noir and uh, the guy who was uh, doing the show that night rec recognized him and said to him, oh we have the Prince of Wales again and the Prince of Wales was with his wife that night and he said, well this man came here last night but I think he was with a different woman. <laughs> so there's a side of Cabaret to me that is very important, it's the insolence. Especially now, I think we, we need some more of that. We could do some more. Thank you so much. I want to thank again these fabulous filmmakers Cheryl Grant, Julia Kotrabell.